pursue you pursue you with everything we have maybe open our ears open our eyes to everything you have for us maybe take some quiet time and just listen sometimes sitting in silence is uncomfortable we have to sit and be silent to listen and hear you. What's God saying to you? Are you giving him a chance to talk to you? Are you giving a chance to listen? hungry for him? never leaving us, nor forsaking us, for being sovereign, a ruler of supreme power. Thank you, Jesus. Who just wants to spend time with us. Amen. <laughs> Pastor, could I uh, lift up a couple of prayer requests before you get started? Sure. Can I do that? You know, there's three things I want to I want us to pray about. First of all, there's a crew down south on Sunday mornings in a huge warehouse off of Elder Creek Road in Perkin Florence. And there's massive amounts of uh, food and stuff that go through that warehouse that we're not aware of. And, you know, they're down there kind of out of sight, out of mind, and and, and I'm sorry to say that I've kind of forgotten them, and I'm, I don't feel real good about that. We need to honor those guys, Mark Swaim and, and Joseph and all those guys that work down there on Sundays because they roll through tons of food, man, I'm telling you what. And uh, I just, they, they got three or four pallets of MREs. That's meals ready to eat. Those are the prepackaged meals. You know, we've been blessing ministries around town with those things uh, this week. I, I got a load this week. So pray for Mark and Joseph and that whole crew down there. On a Sunday food ministry, and, uh, and love up on those guys if you get a chance to do that. Yeah. Secondly, Sharon uh, Van Kirk, who uh, runs our street ministry on uh, uh, Rush Park and uh, Deliverance Corner, took a tumble. 
last Tuesday. And so she fractured her cheekbone, she broke her leg. We don't know how she went down, but she's not doing good. She's five to six weeks without even being able to drive. So if you have an opportunity to help out to prepare food, get a hold of me um, and, and uh, let's support her and help her. You know, she's a lady that's been uh, helping us for how many years? Five years or better, Pastor? Probably she was, better. She, here's how it's her. Here's how her uh, ministry started. She's driving on Madison Avenue, and there's a guy flying a sign. He stepped off the curb. She hit him with a car, and she killed him. A week later, another guy did the same thing, only she missed that guy. And she said, I'm never going to let these guys beg for food again. I'm going to come down here and feed them. So she started that on Deliverance Corner and came on board with us. So pray for Sharon. And where's Big Joe? He wandered out. Big Joe, he, he walked Pray for Big Joe. Doggone, he was doing so good. He got a job. He's working. And he broke his foot, broke his ankle. So pray the Lord would heal that up quickly. Father, I'm just going to lift up quickly the Sunday uh, food uh, program. Lord Jesus, you bless those guys. You continue to flow food through that place, Lord, to, and uh, supply the needs of, of uh, all the hungry folks that we do. I'm going to lift up Sharon. We pray you minister her body, Lord Jesus, wherever she's hurting. You put that back in order. Heal her quickly, Lord Jesus. You bring lots of help. Let's come alongside her. And then for Big Joe, I pray that you minister in his foot. He'll let him quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you, Patrick. You know, I know that we're a, a Holy Spirit ministry, but I'm, I'm still always amazed at how the Spirit of God orchestrates the worship and the things that people share and how it goes to with right along with the word that God gives me I'm just amazed that song that we just ended with the pursuit do you know that that's so very very important and I was uh, as I was uh, developing uh, the message actually I was developing it God had already had it you know he is the message giver but I was getting scripture and I was gonna pull a a single verse out of uh, Acts chapter 10 to kind of prove a point. And the Lord goes, why don't you be a storyteller tonight and go ahead and tell them about that story. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell some of the story and then I'm going to read because if I read, I'd be reading a lot of scripture. So I'm just going to tell you uh, part of the story. But I'm going to, I'm going to say this. As I was in study and prayer today, that word prayer jumped out at me because many times we rush through things and we neglect sometimes that time just to be still in the presence of God. I know that in my past there were times that I would pray to the breakthrough and then quit. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, God shows up, and I knew He was there, and then I, so, and I, that, it was just beginning. And, you know, when we pursue Him and catch Him, hang on to Him. And I'm talking about that specific presence of God that just literally charges the atmosphere, and you can feel it from the inside out because He's within you. But there's such a release, and when, it's, when that, that glory of God begins to manifest, there he is, there's Joe right there, we just said a prayer for you, brother. Uh, that's where you want to you hang out in that. You want to stay in that place as long as you can. That's why we can't get in a hurry going through praise and worship. See, praise and worship and prayer, they're all joined together because it's all giving our all, getting all distractions out of the way of our soul realm and the physical realm, those, the eye gates and the ear gates and all that that has contact with this world, that can be a disruption. But sometimes the disruption is in our soul. Sometimes we just need to have peace within our soul. Because if you're in turmoil, it's hard to concentrate on anything. And God doesn't want us to live in a state of turmoil or chaos 
or distraction or confusion. God, the Spirit of God has nothing to do with those things. Because where His presence is, where His Spirit is, there is peace. As a matter of fact, he is the very prince of peace. And it, and it goes beyond just our realization of it, our understanding of it, to understand that, that the nature of God is released to us and then through us by us just abiding in his presence. But that prayer will take us there. Now I'm gonna now I'm what I'm gonna do is jump back and do something else because I've got to I've got to do this. I was reading it, but I didn't realize I was gonna share it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and share it. It's out of Second Chronicles seven fourteen. It says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves <laughs> I gotta say this right now. God, I, I repent for just assuming to ever know your full will for myself or your people. I repent for that. And I, sh and I repent for not always in every situation seeking your counsel first instead of just assuming. Anyway, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray... Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will heal, heal their land. What was this? Really, where's the beginning of that sin? I think it says it right there in the verse. In our arrogance and in our cockiness, assuming to know and then when we're in that state of mind, we neglect the communication that we should be having with God. So the sin of that is the prayerlessness. And he's calling his people here to return. And I mean, in the verse preceding that, the rain, he said, I'll stop the rains and I'll send the locusts. The heavens won't open and it ain't going to bless your land. That's what it means by healing the land. That kind of sounds like California. But if we repent for our prayerlessness and begin that pursuit like Tammy was talking about, where we, we're after God and going into that place and then commune with Him and stay with Him there. Okay, you all ready for the story? I just felt because that was kind of just kept impressing on me as I was looking at the message that was to be brought tonight but I'm gonna do before I even move on I'm just gonna just do y'all just want to know him more do you just want more of his fullness and his nature within you then right now I just release a desire on just just these folks right here father that you would give them such a hunger and a desire to come to you, not once a week, not once a month, but even daily, on a daily basis, when they open their eyes in the morning, that you will remind them that you are waiting to have communion with them, Father, and give them a deep, deep hunger, a deep desire just to come to you, to get to know you more, and just to abide in your presence, because we all know what happens and what changes when we dwell in your presence, Father? Because it changes us. It changes us and brings us to a place where your full nature is released in your people. And then it begins to spread to everything that we touch, everywhere that we walk and everywhere that we go. It begins to influence the very environment because your kingdom is present. And when your kingdom is present, change happens. Miracles just happen in your presence, God, because you are light. You are life. You are the very essence of all life. Okay, I got a little passionate there. So we just release that right now to these folks. Hunger for your presence, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, when you wake up in the morning, and for some weird reason, God comes across your mind, don't forget. And you know, here's the thing. When you are bringing change into your spiritual life, don't try to go for the full gusto. Okay, I'm going to start praying an hour every morning. Right. Don't set yourself up for failure. Why don't you start with the five minutes and see what happens? Marathon runner don't take off running 26 miles. Takes a little at a time. Pretty soon it's just nature to them. Here's the thing. When we begin to pursue God and you begin to, to get to know Him and the love relationship begins to increase, you can't do without Him. You can't live without Him. Because there's nothing like being in His presence. Um, okay. There's a... There's, a, there's actually a history, for those of you who don't know, there's an actual history book in the New Testament. Does anybody know what it is? Huh? It's called the Acts. It's basically a history of the early church and all the things that begin to happen. And um, talks about the disciples and the things that they did after Jesus' resurrection and ascension and as they begin to fulfill the command of go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And even before Paul really began his mission from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle to the nations, do you know that it was Peter who first received the vision from heaven? And here's the thing. Peter was a man of prayer, and he prayed daily, every day, going back to what I was talking about. And as I was looking at this, it just hit me and here Peter would get up six six in the morning he, and he'd pray go out on the roof of the uh, the place where he was at and he'd pray or wherever he was staying he'd get up and he'd pray because Jesus his master the one who taught him personally he instilled it in his disciples that you always need to pray you got to get with the father and pray and if Jesus did that, how much more do his disciples need to do that? And so he was a devout man of prayer. And he was, uh, had, and as a matter of fact, he had just raised uh, this woman who was a servant of God. Actually, she ministered to the poor, and she just didn't pray and, 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 and minister. She actually went out and did things, kind of like what some of you do, and minister. And she had died, she had passed away. And they had called Peter, and he goes in, and he puts everybody out. He sends them out of the room. Probably sent doubt out with it. And he said, Tabitha, arise. And he takes her by the hand, and he raises her up alive, and goes and presents her alive to everybody. And of course, it spread like wildfire. Now, this has just happened. Yet, he's still getting up at 6 in the morning and praying. He didn't get big-headed. You know, we just need to remain humble when God uses us to do great things. Actually, increase our pursuit. Because sometimes I think we get confused that if God uses us to do something, we take it that it's an approval on everything else we're doing and then we can just kick back and take our ease to the contrary we should pursue even more okay that's all I'm gonna say about that right there and there was another man who at this same time was praying now this particular morning Peter gets up this other man had been praying and he his name was Cornelius and he was of the Italian band and he was a, uh, a, a leader and a centurion, which means he had, you know, at least a hundred men under him. And, but he had been praying. The Bible says that he was a good and devout man and followed God. And he's praying one morning, the ninth hour, and a man in real bright apparel appears to him. And it says, Cornelius, your alms and your prayers have come before God. 
and he has heard your request. And he said, go and send and tell S Simon, whose surname is Peter, over in Joppa to get over here and speak to you. So he sends two of his servants and one of his soldiers to go fetch Peter. Peter that morning, it, took, it was like a two-day journey for them to get there. And then they arrive, Peter's up there praying, he's hungry, and God shows him a vision. The, the, the thing that's so powerful and important about this is that when the Spirit of God is involved, He can overturn your religious beliefs and ideas and mindsets. So, Peter being very Jewish, and he's hungry, and he has this vision, and God shows him all these animals, and says, Peter, arise, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh, not so, God. I have never put anything common or unclean to my lips. And God said, what I have declared clean, don't call it unclean or common. Hmm. This happened to Peter three times. Peter comes out of the trance, and he's like, whoa, well, the Spirit of God comes in and says, Peter, there's three men down at your door looking for you. Go listen to them. So Peter just starts going down, and there they are. And he says, uh, I'm Peter. I'm the one you're looking for. What do you want? And so they begin to tell him about their master Cornelius and that he needs to come with them. And this is a pretty big journey. So Peter says, well, come on in, hang out, spend the night with me, and I'll take care of you, and then we'll go. And they do. And Peter arrives at the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius, in the meantime, this is a man of faith. Now remember, he's not Jewish. And you've got to also remember that there was a lot of division, a lot of separation, a lot of prejudice. As a matter of fact, they called anyone who wasn't like them dogs. They looked down their nose at them, and God, who is a God of love and a God of unity, is trying to bring people together. So he's overriding their religious mindsets by his spirit and doing things through dreams and visions and angelic visitations. I think the world is in need of that right now. I really do. They, they cry for unity. But yet, when a bunch of politicians are putting their heads together, or peoples from different groups are trying to come into agreement, it's not going to work. Because, do you see, like Patrick was just sharing, like what I, was t what I talk about, there can't be multiple heads and multiple ideas. There can only be one head in the place of leadership. There's many voices gone out into the world, but you can... Truly, if you want to walk in life and peace and unity and love and liberty, you can only listen to the one voice. you got to know the voice of God. I'm telling you. So, Peter goes, and let, let, let me see where we're going to pick this up. See if I told enough of the story. Okay, they bring him into the house. Peter looks around and he sees the group of people he's talking to. And he says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. What he had just said in the scripture before this is, you know that us Jews just don't go hang out with people of other nations or other tribes. We, we don't do that. And then he says this, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. That's almost like a slam. Think about it. But, you see, he's just coming out of his little closet here. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Oh, good words, Peter. <laughs> and the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ 
He is Lord of all. Now he's starting to preach. Now he's doing what he was commissioned to do and the reason he was sent there. He's going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The word that you know which was proclaimed through all Judea and begin from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now why did he make that clarification there? Because John preached from Old Covenant the water baptism. But remember what John said, there comes one after I that is mightier than I am. And I'm not losey, uh, worthy to loose the sandal strap on his shoe. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's New Covenant Kingdom Baptism. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Now this was, this was my original verse that I was only going to use. Okay, So this was the main point of all this. But I'm going to go ahead and read it to you now. And then some more. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Now he's going to give his personal testimony to it. And we are witnesses of all the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Now you just slapped him down with that point. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. These are wonderful words. Can you imagine? The gospel right here and right now of this historic account of Peter preaching to the Gentiles, Jesus Christ. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to, to, vet, to testify that is, he is, was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him shall receive Remission of sin. Is this amazing? Oh, what? And then they were baptized. And the Gentile ministry began. Because now we know that the gospel was always to all kindred, all tribes, all people, all tongues. Don't matter what side of the track you were born on whether you are male or female, whether you are rich or poor. And by the way, there is a lot of division down those lines right there, still to this very day. You think in a, in a world that it, you know, is supposed to be, have knowledge and understanding and, 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 and compassionate and love for one another that we could all get along and still the, the, the rich and the poor, it's hard for them to get along. How male and female, it's just hard for them sometimes to get along. But I'll tell you what, in the kingdom of God, none of that matters. Because there is neither male nor female in his eyes. That doesn't mean he doesn't see male and female, or he doesn't see color. Of course he does. It's kind of silly to say we don't see color. God created color. He created it for a purpose and a reason. Some of the things that we say are just actually silly. Some of them are actually racist remarks. You might not have a racist heart, but you repeat things and you don't even know what you're saying. God embraces our differences. That's, but that's the reason why we need unity, because we are different. If we were all alike, we wouldn't need unity, because we would all be on the same page. And, but how dull would that be? Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And... Even as Peter, as he was talking to him there, you saw how it, when he began to preach the gospel, it just bust through. Because Jesus is the game changer. Now going back to the kingdom, my whole, the point of my message that I wanted to talk about was actually about the miracles. The uh, being in the presence of God 
how it begins to change us and the effect that it has on us. And I don't think so much that uh, God does miracles to prove who he is, because when Jesus was challenged to do a miracle, he refused to do it. As a matter of fact, there's scripture in the Bible here. I think I got a couple of them here that talks about that very thing. Oh, here it is. Um, Mark 8, 12, but he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Mark or Matthew 16, 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after signs. No sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What did he mean by that? Well, the only sign that they would see really concerning him would be the sign of Jonah, which would be that he would be in the belly of the well for three days and then he would arise. And that was the sign. But we're not supposed to seek after the signs. Matter of fact, the scripture says that the signs should follow, signs and wonders should follow us. But then Bill made a good point. If you, <laughs> Bill Johnson, I just heard him say this the other day. If signs and wonders ain't following you, follow after them until they follow you. <laughs> That's a pretty good point. But th there's a thing being said here about those who only want a sign. Because they don't care about the love of God. They don't care about, they just want to be entertained. They want to see some miracle. It has nothing to do with compassion or the love of God. And that's on the opposite side of the coin. When we are in the presence of God and pursuing Him, it all becomes about the relationship that we have with Him. It becomes the love that is so deep-rooted for God that we can't help but begin to love those around us. As a matter of fact, the effects of this is so powerful that the love that is in God actually is transplanted within us and that heart of bitterness and unforgiveness and hatred and bigotry and racism and all of that begins to melt away because we begin to see with the eyes of God and that they're all God's children and that there's no difference of separation in us and then and only then can true forgiveness and true compassion be exhibited to our lives because we pursued Him long enough and hard enough to set with Him and get to know Him and be changed from the inside out and now be a child of the living God and be turned inside out for Him to be made perfect, in other words, complete in Him so that He might flow through us to a world that is so desperately in need of the light. You get that? And it's about light. It's about coming to the light. Not stumbling around in the darkness anymore. But to walk fully immersed in the, in the light. You see, what light does, it drives away the dark. It drives away the wickedness. It drives away the evil heart because it cannot coexist. Darkness and light cannot coexist in the same house. I put some thought to that. How did that become so powerful? It actually goes all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 1 verse 3 says, Then God said, Let there be light. There was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. So he made a division there. And he loved the light, and he saw the light, and when he spoke the light into existence, God's a God of light. So I pursued that. Acts twenty six fifteen. So I said, Who are you, Lord? Now I'm going to read to you Paul. He's just, I, we did Peter, I'm going to do a little Paul. Actually, this is his conversion right here. 
the man who was trying to destroy Christianity at, at its infancy and imprisoning and killing Christians, and he runs headlong un, into the light. Listen to this. And when he does, he says, he says, who are you, Lord, to the light that blinded him? The thing is, if you're in darkness and somebody shines light directly in your eye, doesn't help much, does it? Blinded by it. Scripture talks about this, but those who stand afar off can see what's happening. They can see the light. Listen to what, listen to what the light said to Saul of Tarsus. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Who was Saul of Tarsus persecuting? Christians. Followers of Christ. Believers. I don't even know. How, I don't even, I'm not sure if they were even called Christians yet because that happened in Antioch. Maybe around the same time. They were called the way. That's what they were called. The way. Period. He says... But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of, the, bo both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. So here's the stage where he's actually going to send and prepare Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle of Grace. Paul the Apostle, a minister to the Gentile nations. I mean, this is incredible. And he was no doubt one of the greatest minds of his time. And he was so religiously set on his track and his mission that he assumed to know God's will and God's wishes and we're pursuing and, and destroying the very people that God has chosen and rose up. And then he runs headlong into the light. And he says this, And to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness and sins, and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by me in faith. Isn't that incredible? In John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. Talking about the cleansing crimson stream of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ so washes and cleanses us that there is even no need to hide any longer. And it doesn't matter about our sins of the past because it's all about the righteousness of God now. Not something that we did, but that the Lord Jesus did for us. And when we meet Him and experience Him and taste that, it frees us. No more worried about the things that plague us and the things that chase us down and all those temptations and all that old lifestyle because he takes and removes that all away and he gives us a brand new life and a hunger for spiritual things now so much so that we can walk in the light on a daily basis and here's the fun part when the light is truly in you that life that power that magnetism, which really has nothing to do with you at all, but it's all about the one who you said yes to, and he came into your house, and he set up living quarters there, and he now lives in you. It is that life and that light and that power that will begin to attract people to you. Don't ever get confused and think that you're the light. But you see, Jesus is the light of all mankind and when you walk in that light there is such an attraction and such a power there and I think that we need to really pursue get back to the pursuit of the presence of God so that we are continually walking in the light and not have a thousand different missions in a day but just fulfill 
the things that you need to as you walk in Him and pursue and follow Him. Drop all the other agendas. I mean, I used to hear people talk about, you know, how they prioritize things in their life. And God, they got God and family and employment and all this. Well, guess what, kids? If you make your priority God, 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 you will take care of your family. You will be the best at your employment. You will shine because you have put God at the center of your relationship, at the center of your heart, at the center of everything that you do and everything that you are, and it will shine bright and the world won't miss it. Because He's the light of the world. Think about that, the light of the world. I, I want to change the words to the song, This Little Light of Mine. I mean, it's a great little jingle, you know. I'm going to let it shine. But it's not little. It's Him. He's the light. And so, my other point. You know, I'm going to miss this building. I really am. But let me finish my point. It just, it just hit me. This is the last time I'm going to maybe preach here. So, Who knows? Maybe not. But the pursuit of the power, the pursuit of the miracles, you know, and, because I want miracles to happen, but I want them to just happen. Not that we are after miracles and, and after the supernatural or anything like that. Because if we make it about that, then, then you know, the people that we'll get will be spectators. People will come to, the, oh, see what, what's happening over there. You know what? I want people to come because they're going to experience God. And then when they come in, nobody has to say anything to them or lay hands on them because they'll walk into the presence of God and so get hit by the light. It drives out the darkness. It drives out sickness. It drives out shame. It drives out embarrassment. It drives out hatred and bitterness. And it drives out racism and all of those ugly things that dwell and live in the darkness and that is so divisive and has nothing to do with God. But when we walk in the light and they come into the light, they will be consumed by the light and all that they'll want to do is live in the light because he's the light let us be pursuers of his presence and just shed a little love share a little love show a little love <laughs> love a little love a lot all right i think i got it out all right god bless you all there's communion tonight uh so let's just hang out and fellowship for a while. What do you say? Love on each other. If somebody needs a, needs a prayer or something, come on up. Let's just be the body of Christ together and love on each other. And just expect that God will do exactly what he said because I know he will. God bless you all.